What is EGCG and should you take it? EGCG is an acronym that stands for epigallocatic and gallate. It belongs to a, an antioxidant class called catechins, which are types of flavonoids that are found most abundantly in green tea. So EGCG is the most abundant catechin that is found in green tea. So the question is, why would you take it? Should you take it? And the answer is, um, is probably pretty straightforward. If you can think of any bad thing, illness, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, endothelial dysfunction, breast cancer, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, cervical dysplasia, HPV related disorders, um, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, pretty much just about any sort of chronic illness you can think of. Um, green tea and EGCG and these catechins have um, been shown to be of benefit. So rule of thumb is pretty much any nasty thing that you could have is probably going to benefit by EGCG. So let's take a look at a little bit of the research that is out there on EGCG. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to belabor this. I mean, there's tons of research articles. I'd rather just kind of touch upon a couple just to give an idea that, you know, there is evidentiary basis for using EGCG and green tea extract. Since I had just mentioned um, all of the different um, applications of green tea extract, why don't we start by going to pubmed.gov. So PubMed, if you don't know about PubMed, it is the National Library of Medicine and National Institute of Health joint database. So this is where you find all published research. So you can just do a basic search here. So if we come in this, in the search um, line, we can put in EGCG and let's just look at that initially. So EGCG, what this shows is that there's 459 studies published um, in index medical journals, so different medical journals um, that have something to do with EGCG. So, and some of these are gonna be reviews. Like if we look at this one, we can see therapeutic effects of EGCG, um, you know, and then so often they'll end up having the, um, not only the abstract, and sometimes you can get a conclusion and get some information just from the basic abstract, but if it looks like it's good abstract, then you can look and see if they have the entire article that's available. Um, so that's pretty useful. And then, you know, here's another one just on green tea. Um, this one happens to have the entire article, so you can actually get the entire article, but this one's, um, pretty interesting. And um, the other benefit is that you'll find similar articles. So you can look below and it'll have, you know, list all types of um, studies that are published that have something to do with EGCG. If we look at uh, EGCG heart disease, um, you know, here we have 19 studies showing something to do with cardiovascular or heart disease. And then again, like I was just saying, oops, um, if we pull up one of these studies, like say this one, then it'll show similar studies to this one down below. So we can see here's green tea um, polyphenols looking at adhesion molecules and anti-inflammatory action of green tea. Um, so very interesting, but we wanna get back on track here with, um, if we look at EGCG and um, I guess let's just look at HPV. Um, there's two studies here that have something to do with EGCG and um, either cervical cancer or other types of this one. The second one here is actually on warts. But I'm going to go over these in a little bit more detail, these two studies. I picked this study because it's a review, so it goes over just some of the mechanisms and the suppressive effects of EGCG on cervical cancer. So this is actually the entire study. Um, you know, so when I went to PubMed, this was available, um, immediately, but what's nice about this is it just shows a lot of the effects of what EGCG does. So the anti-proliferative effects of EGCG on cervical cancer cells, and that it induces cell cycle arrest, um, regulates cell cancer growth. It goes through a lot of the mechanisms of how this works. Here it's showing EGCG down-regulating, um, the E7 oncogene. 
um, and then you know more anti-metastatic effect on cervical cancer cells, the pro-apoptosis of cervical cancer cells, which is the um, death of, of cell cancer, um, of cancer cells. You know, there's some nice diagrams in here too, EGCG downregulating E6 um, oncogene. So the E6 and E7 oncogenes are the two genes that characterize high-risk HPV. So the difference between the low-risk strains and high-risk strains and why everybody gets worked up about the high-risk strains is high-risk strains have um, two genes, which are the E6 and E7 oncogenes. So one of the things that green tea has the ability to do is to actually downregulate those two oncogenes. And those oncogenes are responsible for the, you know, sort of the nastiness of the high risk strains. So this is showing some of the mechanisms, um, how that does that. This study also was looking at some of the synergistic effects with other pharmaceuticals. So sometimes, you know, there's even studies on chemotherapy drugs combined with natural substances like curcumin and green tea and all sorts of things. So there's actually a fair amount of um, research here is EGCG used with cisplatin and retinoic acid, platinum. So, you know, it's frustrating because you often hear how, um, you know, detractors of natural medicine will say that, oh, there's, where's the research on that? Or, or there's no research on that. Most of the time there is research and they just aren't aware of the research. Um, so finally, you know, this is a good review. So again, this is showing all some of the mechanisms of what EGCG does in preventing cervical cancer as well as helping to treat certain, now I'm not suggesting that you should use EGCG for cervical cancer. Um, I'm just showing some of the facts of, of some of the research that's out there on this. Here's a review, you know, a good table showing some of the, the cell killing or cytotoxic activities of EGCG on human cervical cancer cell lines. And on the right here shows all the references. So there's a whole ton of mechanisms. I mean, these are just mechanisms of EGCG on cervical cancer and all the different studies that have shown those effects over time. And then finally, if we want to you know, look at the, the conclusion here, EGCG has the ability, it's anti-proliferative, it's anti-metastatic, it, it's pro-apoptosis, which means it just kills, helps kill um, cervical cancer cells. So pretty interesting stuff. Here's another review. What I like about this study is that it's looking at some topical um, use of green tea and EGCG um, for warts as well as some other like dysplasia and some other um, HPV related disorders but it's looking at you know there was so much interest in green tea and an EGCG that some companies actually produce some um, trademarked or prescription based proprietary products like polyphenon E and uh, Verig Verigen were approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use with uh, warts. So there definitely is some basis for using these types of compounds with HPV-related disorders. But let's let's take a look at this. Um, there was a couple things I wanted to look at as far as um, yeah here. So there's here's a clinical study that looked at 503 patients. Um, and then they were treating anogenital warts and they found that um, there seemed to be a positive effect when they actually looked overall. Um, they had, you know, good results and, and was kind of interesting. So that's, you know, that was with warts, however. And then um, this is a study where we were looking at actually cervical lesions or cervical dysplasia and um, you know, they were looking at, again, this polyphenon E, which is a, an ointment, and they were looking at using capsules. Um, they were actually looking at using the polyphenon E capsule. Polyphenon E capsule alone combined with um, EGCG and then also EGCG alone. And um, what they actually found was that there was a positive um, response when they looked at the ointment alone, the polyphenon E, they had a 74% response rate, ointment plus polyphenon E. So they even used it orally. So they had a, a topical polyphenon E and they had the oral polyphenon E. 
When you use both together, it was 75% response. Polyphenin E capsule alone, in other words, the oral part of it was a 50% response. And EGCG orally alone had um, a 60% response. So, um, you know, that's definitely interesting um, since that was a clinical study. But then there's other, you know, and this was a recent study. This was um, in 2020, I think it was June of 2020. And they found, you know, and they finally, you know, their, their final conclusion here was, you know, that, um, you know, there were some protective effect factors against cervical cancer as well as cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or SIN, which is dysplasia. And they thought that green tea might reduce the risk of cervical cancer. There's some conflicting studies. I'm not going to say that, you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread necessarily, but there's enough data. There's enough research on both oral uh, green tea as well as topical green tea that I think for some, for some individuals, I think it has to be examined and there may be an application for it. So based on the fact that it appears that EGCG or green tea extract has some application with HPV related disorders and conditions, should you take it? Now I don't use green tea extract with everyone. Um, I like to keep things cost effective. So who should use EGCG or green tea extract? I would probably consider it if you're having problems with HPV. In other words, if you have moderate, severe dysplasia, maybe you have dysplasia in the canal, maybe it's, you know, been there for a few years, it doesn't want to go away. Maybe you've already had a leap or two and it's still, you're still having problems with it and still having dysplasia. I mean, there's an argument to be made for using it in those circumstances. Um, I mean, you can make an argument too to use it with just HPV. I mean, what it does with HPV only, if you only have HPV and you have no dysplasia, then one of the things green tea does um, is to help prevent dysplasia from occurring, uh, which is important because if you start developing dysplasia, obviously that's, that's the problem with HPV. Having HPV is not the problem as much as is HPV going to cause cervical cancer. So, I mean, there's an argument to be, to use it in, 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 in every case, but again, I try to keep things cost effective. So I'm more likely to use it with severe cases and less likely to use it with um, less severe cases or where maybe it's HPV only. Um, but again, I'm trying to keep it cost effective and, and do as little as possible to get the job done. As far as topically, you know, I'll probably do a different video on warts at some point. So I'm not really talking much about, I'm not really talking about warts in this video. I'm talking about HPV and dysplasia because those tend to be, um, I tend to see a little bit more of that and it's more problematic, but I have never been a big fan of using, well, I shouldn't say never. I'm currently not a fan of using suppositories with dysplasia. I've treated this for 25 years and I've used suppositories in the past and I never found them to be very effective. And now at this point, if you have dysplasia, my take on it and my position is that if you have any dysplasia and you can do escharotic treatment, that's what I would do because escharotic treatment, 99% of the time, it's going to get rid of dysplasia. I just don't have that confidence in suppositories. Why well, mess around with suppositories for months when um, it's not, I don't think, or I haven't found that it's all that likely that the suppositories are going to get rid of dysplasia. However, if you have HPV only and you have no dysplasia, then I would probably use a suppository. Um, I, and I have been doing that. I've been using curcumin and green tea suppositories for um, a while now, and I've been getting actually very good results in clearing HPV in cases where there's no dysplasia. So HPV only, I've been alternating between curcumin and a green tea um, suppository. Now, if you go to the video description below, I have a link for suppositories and if you click that link so the reason i'm showing you this is it can be a little bit confusing when you go to that suppository website but i'm just picking a, an older video here but in the video description below i have the link for the vaginal suppositories that i use now these i tend to use for hpv only disorders i'm not a big advocate of using these for dysplasia if you can do the escharotic i would do that 
Um, but if you go to this website, you want to go to products and then to antioxidant protection where it lists those suppositories. So you have both the curcumin as well as the green tea suppository. So for HPV, I alternate between, you know, the curcumin suppositories one night and then the green tea suppository the next night. If you're having, and I didn't really talk about this, but some women get warts on their cervix. Um, most of the time they don't know it, but you sometimes see them when you're doing examination or there's some women I'm treating for dysplasia where they'll also have these sort of wart-like lesions on the cervix and they're called uh, exophytic condylomas. So if you were to have one of these condylomas or wart-like type structures on the cervix with or without dysplasia, I would use these green tea suppositories by themselves. If you have um, HPV, that you're trying to get rid of, then I would use both the curcumin and the green tea and alternate between the two of these. So if you're going to use green tea extract or EGCG for HPV related disorders, how should you take it? I use Thorne's um, green tea phytosome. So I have a link in the video description below for my dispensary at Thorne. Um, Thorne does a number of products where it's called a phytosome and what they do is they add phosphatidylcholine to whatever substance that creates something called a phytosome which greatly enhances the absorption and utilization of whatever the compound is. If you're going to do, um, if you're going to do a product like this, like an EGCG or some type of extract, you want to be doing about 200 to 250 milligrams twice a day with food. Now there's an alternative. Um, for those of you who are into tea, because um, again, this is a green tea extract, so you can go do green tea. Green tea is probably not going to have that much of the catechin or the EGCG in it. However, matcha tea has more. So matcha tea is the whole green, um, the whole green tea leaf. So it's actually powdered up. And the way that you make matcha tea is I started drinking matcha tea recently, but you get all this little cool stuff. You get like the little strainer and you get the little nifty bamboo little um, spoon because again, it's powder. So you heat your water about 70 to 80 degrees, 80 degrees centigrade. And then you, you scoop up the green tea and then, cause you want to sift it. So again, it's the whole um, leaf that's in there that's powdered. So you don't want, you don't want to have any clumping or anything, but you put the powder in the bowl, you take the water that's, now 70 to 80 degrees, you pour it in and then you use this, this nifty little bamboo whisk and you, you whip the living hell out of it um, to the point where you get a little bit of foam. It ends up being super green. It's pretty crazy how green um, the matcha is. And um, you know, that's, that's enjoyable. So if you're a green tea drinker, I would, I would say maybe you wanna do the matcha tea. If you're gonna do the matcha tea instead of a green tea extract, you need to be doing it every day, really. Um, so if you don't think you're going to be drinking the tea every day or you don't have the time to futz around heating up the water and doing all that sort of stuff, then I would probably just get the green tea extract and take it like that. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, click the like button, share the video, and subscribe to my channel.